All right. Well, I am really excited about this panel. Um, it has been a topic of discussion, particularly when you think about being an HR leader within your organizations, dealing with burnout within your organizations, not only your employees, but your leaders, folks inside and outside. But the one thing we often in HR don't do is really look internally to our own teams. If you think of the analogy when you're and this is probably not the greatest analogy, but when you're on an airplane, right? The instructions are put your mask on first before you can to uh, before you can attend to others. Uh, I think oftentimes HR forgets to put their mask on. So this session, we're talking about burnout specifically on people teams. Uh, my name is Anthony Onesto. I will be your moderator. Um, I am chief people officer at a company called Suzy. I've been in the HR business for many, many years. You can tell by the gray hair. And I'm excited to introduce some folks with me today, fellow HR leaders that have, that have been thinking about burnout, not only within their organizations, but with on their HR teams. And so they're here hopefully to provide some advice some guidance. Uh, we're all making stuff up as we go, of course, during this crazy times. But first, I'd like to introduce Jonathan Basker. Jonathan is CEO of Basker and Company. Jonathan, tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. Uh, nice to be with you, by the way. And Cindy, it's nice to see you again. Uh, I am an HR consultant and a leadership coach. And I focus on startups as an ecosystem and mostly moments of scale, growth, change evolution. Uh, work a lot with companies that are somewhere between their seed funding stage to series C um, in that moment where there's just a lot changing, evolving, unfolding, retracting, and going on in general. Great. And we also, uh, third panelist here today, welcome to Cindy Gordon. Uh, Cindy is founder of Leachin LLC and is a former people, uh, chief people officer at Policy Genius. Cindy, great to see you. Great to see you. Thank you for having me. Um, so I'm Cindy Gordon, and I'm currently an HR consultant and advisor for a variety of companies within the um, VC space. Prior to building my own practice, I was the head of people at Policy Genius, as you mentioned, Anthony. And before that, um, the head of people at Oscar, and then I spent about 15 years or so at McKinsey & Company. I'm excited to be here and talk to talk about a very important topic. Awesome. Good to see both of you. So let's just get right in it. Why waste any time here? And so the first question, I'm going to throw it off to, to Cindy first, is how do you specifically define burnout? There's just so many different definitions of burnout. How do you specifically define uh, burnout? Yeah, and I think it depends what day you catch me. But um, today, <laughs> as I was thinking through it, um, I like to think of it as a, a state of exhaustion. And it can have really, really big devastating effects on mental and physical well-being and day-to-day -day functioning. I think it can impact one's ability to um, be productive, to perform um, their day-to-day -day duties. It can impact level of focus and brain function and emotional state, and um, it can be pretty debilitating. Absolutely. Uh, Jonathan, let's go to you. What do you. How do you specifically define burnout? Sure. So there are people that have an experience where their life uh, doesn't fully make sense to them. It abrades against them and like how, how and where and, uh, sort of the way they want to be doesn't line up with what's happening. And so the effect can be that every day they're waking up with less energy and feeling worse than the day before. Um, when that hits zero, like when, when that process completes and they wake up one day with like nothing left, that's burnout. Oh, that yeah. resonates. Sorry. <laughs> 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 that sounds like Monday, by the way. Um, but no, I, you know, if you look at the, <laughs> I'm teasing. You know, if you look at the WHO definition, right, it's it's really diagnosed as a condition that is a result of chronic workplace stress or that has not been successfully managed. And, you know, one of the things we, we did at Suzy recently is we identified, we pulse our employees every week. Uh, and I know that sounds exhausting, particularly for our leaders, but it's been an incredible tool for us to really understand, especially during COVID, some of the challenges uh, folks were having. And we were 
there, not, not that anyone actually specifically said the word burnout, although there were a couple, there, were this tre- there, there was this trend that we were seeing in the Pulse survey every week around burnout. Um, it's just so very specific. So it was very difficult for us to really figure out, okay, what's the right solution? So we, we had a, a, a mental health therapist do a bunch of sessions. And one of the ones that really resonated to me around burnout, uh, and again, I think the definition is, is very specific to the individual, but I think Jonathan, Cindy, you did, did an awesome job there. Um, was this idea of boundaries, right? And, and if you look at the WHO definition, it's really just not allowing those boundaries, you know, get, uh, or allowing those boundaries to continue to be infiltrated uh, by other folks and not really setting those boundaries. And I think that's exactly what you folks are saying, the idea of not having these boundaries and just getting to that empty level, right? If you think of it as like a gas tank, for instance. Um, so what do you, what do you when, when you think about burnout, especially as the definition, oftentimes, like I talked about in our pulse survey, it's difficult to, uh, to identify the signs of burnout. Do you, anything specifically, I'll go to you, Jonathan, we'll, we'll trade back and forth here. Um, what, any signs of common or common signs of burnout that you've seen specifically on people team. So Jonathan, in your capacity doing consulting, um, any, any signs that you can see that would give the audience here? And by the way, just, uh, just a quick side note, as you're, you're listening to us today, feel free to go into the chat on the side here. Let us know what you love. Um, more importantly, what, what you really love, uh, just use the chat, the chat function on the side and, and, and just give us some shout outs and, and, uh, and let us know how we're doing. But otherwise, uh, back to the question, um, in terms of burnout, specifically on people teams, any, any signs, anything where you can identify that burnout is, is, is about to happen or, or is, is happening? Mm. I mean, I, I would simplify this into two styles of burnout that I've seen people experience. And one surprises them just as much as it surprises the people around them. Uh, and the other, I think, is more obvious. So I think there's like, you know, a silent killer version of this. and. I said gas tank before, but if you imagine like a battery metaphor instead, I think there's people whose battery, when it starts to drain, they like, it doesn't operate at a hundred percent. And so you can see that, you know, Anthony is normally so on the ball and I'm seeing a lot of things slip lately. There's other people that just burn at full efficiency, that they just hit zero one day, um, which I think we're seeing with some of this great resignation work or both, but, but I think there are some people that don't even know they're about to burn out until they wake up one day and they just don't have it to give. I I think those are harder to detect and and almost need to be proactively managed for like, you know, there's, there's a certain type of person that um, I don't want to infantilize, but might even need to be protected from themselves a little bit Mm -hmm. because their instinct in a moment of stress, which a lot of us are in right now is going to be to double down. That's their coping mechanism. Uh, For the other folks, it's more obvious where uh, what you'll see is, you know, You'll just see obvious stress. You'll see a shift in their actual, not just behavior, but their outputs. Um, And effectively, if you notice a change, you may want to get curious about that change. Even if they're working harder, that may be a sign that they're trying to keep up with what feels like an increased demand that they don't feel they can meet. Or again, one of those experiences where they are um, draining more than they're replenishing. And, And I love your point there because oftentimes we think of burnout specifically as defined um, in the analogy of the battery, right? Low, low, low. And whether it's identifying certain areas of performance or like you said, Anthony is usually this way and he's not. But I love your point about the fact that some folks, the way to identify this in another way, and it's it's really eye-opening for me specifically, is the folks that double down on the work, right? The folks that, um, you know, typically they have one Red Bull on the Zooms and now they have three or something like that. And I don't mean to kid, but there are folks like that. Um, you're now seeing the folks. So that, that's really interesting. I think that's a great point for, for our audience here, especially as HR leaders and leaders of organizations, that it's not necessarily just the uh, deterioration of, of performance. It's It could be that folks that are taking on more and more, and that's that's contributing to to their own burnout or it's their their way of dealing with it. Cindy, you've you've been head of HR for a bunch of different companies. How how are you particularly on the people team specifically if you wanted to talk about that, but how have you uh, seen signs of, of burnout on your teams? Um, 
I think I'm actually going to talk about my own burnout. Um, Great. Because it, it hits home for me. And I think um, what Basker was saying about the two different types, it's so interesting to look at it from that perspective, because I would argue that I was likely in that first bucket for years, <laughs> um, running strictly off of cortisol, and I could make it happen, but then like somehow I, something was sacrificed. But I think that second bucket became more and more of a like sneak attack on me um, 18 months ago, um, or uh, maybe a little bit before that. And um, so mine, my experience with burnout is um, a mix of those two things. And maybe there are even stages to it if we were to like break this down into um, something even more um, complex because I think it is complex. Um, with me, like I'll talk about the second bucket because I, it really snuck up on me. I don't even think I realized that it was happening. I was in denial. I thought, oh, why am I so tired? Why am I so exhausted? Or, oh, Cindy, you flubbed up. You made that um, slight oversight on that project. Or why can't I focus? Or um, like there were a number of things where I just felt like I needed to do more to um, deliver and that it had to do more with my ability or imposter syndrome or fatigue or other things going on in my um, life as the excuse that I didn't realize until like I hit a breaking point. I, um, it, was, it was burnout. Um, so I think, you know, in my very inarticulate way here um, and reflecting on the feedback I was getting from my own team, um, and loved ones um, outside of work. I um, was low energy, um, no matter how hard I tried to mask it, I was constantly tired, I felt very alone, um, and it showcased itself as dissociation with my loved ones and my team members. I felt in the grip constantly, I was really impatient about hitting like deliverables and projects because I just didn't have the ability to to um, see things for a longer stretch of time. It was cynical and short tempered. Um, I couldn't problem solve or think. And um, I just felt really inadequate. And it was a big hit to my confidence. Um, so that's, those are some signs. And it took an army of people to point that out. And then like some like blind spot and slap in the face for it to hit home for me. And I'm still healing over it. I wound up um, leaving, resigning from my job over a year ago. I'm still trying to figure out how to um, not even heal over um, to um, deal with it. And I'm not suggesting that people leave their jobs. I think there are um, signs that you can pay attention to and a network of um, trusted individuals who can be transparency cops for you. So you don't hit the point that um, I hit. That's my I, biggest um, Yeah, if I, I can I, add. I, absolutely, go ahead. I, I have my own story with with like true burnout and I'll, for time, I'll, I'll skip it. But the punchline is just to agree with Cindy that it was over a year, you know, to really come back to myself. And there is something about this that um, well, it scares me, which is, you know, once so in my experience and talking to a lot of people who've gotten there, like once you hit that point, it's not equal in, equal out, or, uh, you know, to Cindy's story, it may be years of drain and it, it may drain and fill at about the same rate. Um, you know, I sometimes talk about this. I know I keep switching metaphors, but going back to my gasoline tank, it's like you have your gas tank and then you have this reserve tank and like people that have burned out have not just burned through their regular tank that that like reserve tank is gone when you need um you know when you need to dig deep and, and work harder but also the one you need when you want to like experience life fully and, and feel joy or and you need that extra sort of energy or you know something unexpected happens a pet dies or someone gets sick and like you need to be able to that's just gone and it, it that particular tank it refills at a, at a trickle and so I guess I would just agree with and 
amplify what Cindy is saying. I mean, if you, if any of this is resonating, if anyone's listening to this and say, man, some of this sounds familiar, you know, my, my strong encouragement, my hope for that person would be start talking to people about this now, like take it seriously. Uh, let it be okay that maybe your life isn't in balance right now. And that there's something that might need to be shifted. I, I want to, first of all, thank you both for sharing such personal stories with, with us here. Um, you know, just to me, the message I'm receiving is here are two experienced HR leaders and, and business folks that are, have gone through this. Um, and, you know, we're typically, again, goes back to my uh, analogy of putting the mask on, right? Like we really have to take in from a people team perspective, um, we're talking about leaders of people teams sitting here talking about their stories of, of burnout in, in very different ways. And, and it's a great, it's a great example of, of just pure psychological safety here. So thank you both for that. But really, the message also is not only take care, take care of it before it happens, but if it does happen, it's not going to be fixed over time. Like I think Jonathan had mentioned, it's, you know, people, they say when you go on vacation, it takes you, you know, equal amount of time to get back into the swing of things. It's not the same here. It's not a one for one. It'll take a lot longer. And so preventative measures um, are super important. Uh, one of the things we are a data rich society um, and especially in people, you know, we're, we're definitely on the cusp of really driving a lot of decision making in HR. At Suzy, we have a value called assume nothing, validate everything, which is why we pulse our employees uh, instead of what I like to say shooting darts in the dark in HR. Is there a way we could use data to identify burnout? Have you any examples? Have you even tried? Um, it's just so nuanced, frankly, but any ideas on, on how we can use data to really identify or even alleviate burnout, frankly? So well, let's let's jump over to you, John. Um, kind of. Actually, I, no, no. I mean, I, I think can you use. Let me back up even further. Let's be careful with the word data, because I think it gets thrown around a lot these days. And I'm going to use instead information. Um, can you gather information through surveying? Can you gather information through interviewing? Um, yes, you know, and is that valuable? It absolutely can be. Is there some sort of magic um, data gathering process that will illuminate the path for you on this? Probably not. I, I, I don't think that exists. I've never seen it. So I think you can get great signaling if you're paying attention. Um, but at the end of the day, that won't matter very much if you're not, like you could skip that part and get into the actioning part because you're gonna find out what's going on anyway. I mean, it, you know, the, the part that for me looks like resolution or prevention of burnout in organizations, or at least creating an environment that should be reasonably protective against that, that's gonna look a lot like how are people being managed going to have a lot to do with the internal structures. Are they sane? Are they competent? Are they humane? Um, you know, if your CEO is batshit crazy, you can run a, a, you know, survey every day and it will not help anything. Um, and, and so sure you can find out like, oh, you know, people don't like our CEO, but you already know that. I mean, are there some mysteries that you may need some help uncovering? Sure. But my guess is if people are experiencing burnout at your company, the primary reason is not because there's a lack of awareness of what's causing it, because there's a lack of acknowledgement of what's causing it and a lack of willingness to do something about what you're failing to acknowledge needs to be acknowledged and actioned. So like, yeah, of course, of course you should run some surveys, but they don't, I, I want to take, I intentionally want to take the sort of dour viewpoint on that because I don't want to, I don't want to indulge the illusion that that's doing something about it. You haven't done anything yet. And you probably haven't even learned that much. I, I by the way, we totally accept contrarian viewpoints and, and love that, that, that thought process. I think the challenge here, and Cindy, I'd love your thoughts. In this space where we're, in most cases, completely remote, identifying burnout for your team specifically um, is, is more difficult. So are there things outside of surveys and other, and, and I love this shift from data to information, other, other ways we can gather information 
to help identify. Because again, I think one learning from both of your stories, um, and it's in you know it's not novel in any way. I mean, we've seen this with healthcare and other things. It's preventative, right? If we can get to the point where you're not at that point, it's a lot better. I mean, it's common sense, but oftentimes we only look you know twenty twenty uh, after the fact. Uh, is there a way? Um, that other than surveys that we can figure out that there's burnout existing within your people team, within your organizations. Cindy, any, any thoughts on that? Yeah. And I, um, such an interesting perspective, um, from each of you. Um, and I feel like I sit somewhere in the middle or maybe we're all saying the same thing. It's just the words that we're using, but, um, I, data, um, and leveraging it, I think it's um, whatever way you can check in with people <laughs> and communicate with them is is important. And I think we have um, people who are wired differently, and maybe the key stakeholders and decision makers need data um, in order to um, feel like compelled to do anything. And maybe that can be handy. But when I think about it at an individual level, um, and maybe this is data, maybe it's not. I think this is more of like ha having a, a mechanism to check in with your employees is at an individual level using a one to 10, like simple scale um, with an, in your check-ins. Your people should be having, managers should be having weekly or bi-weekly check-ins with their direct reports and starting it out with, where do you sit on a one to 10 scale? just generally, generally and how you're feeling. And let's unpack that. Okay, um, Anthony, you're a seven. And let's say severity is 10 um, and perfect is one. Tell me why you're at a seven and what would it take to get you down to a six? What would it take to get you down to a five? And then we're having a real conversation and removing the struggle of trying to articulate how we're feeling when we're already feeling vulnerable, um, to have these awkward conversations um, with each other about what's really important and what's blocking us or what could be done better. Or maybe we're feeling great and that's great too, but then we have a pulse. And so I think that's one way. And could that be data over time? Sure, you can look at trends, whatever, but you're using a common language and a familiar scale to help you. Um, I think pulse surveys can be helpful to identify trends and to what Jonathan said, it's not going to fix anything and it um, might already be overstating the obvious, but it might not be. It depends where the organization is at and how tied in and clued in companies are. And um, that can be helpful data to see if there's a huge, huge um, like separation between what a company thinks is happening and um, really what isn't happening. But it also gives more of a, a mechanism for employees to voice things that they might not otherwise. And I think that can that can be helpful. Um, so it's, it's a driver of like either validating what we already know or maybe opening us up to um, other things. And it's a way to have more effective communication. Yeah, I, I, I love your point there. And I, I, I do, I think we are saying the same things. I think we're, you know, all sitting on both sides of this. And, and to Jonathan's point, I think, you know, there, there's a great book called Everybody Lies, right? Which talks about how people take survey data, data uh, surveys and how they, they're, what they're rating is the perception of themselves, maybe not the actual. So there's definitely some flaws in that. Jonathan, to you again, how do you take care of the, the caretakers? And then I love where, where Cindy went, which is what doesn't work. So if you want to offer both sides of that equation from your experience. Yeah, uh, I agree with everything Cindy said, which I generally have found I do in any topic because <laughs> uh, Cindy's very smart and very experienced and, and knows a lot. I generally, people should listen to her. Uh, the one thing that Cindy said so far today that I most agree with is this is complex. So I'll give you an answer. I don't mean to take the role of contrarian. That's not my intention here. I do want to talk about a part of this that I think is a bit edgy and maybe even controversial. And I think, and I've seen happen and it doesn't get talked about much. And it's, it's not all of it. It's just a part that I, I'll talk about now. Uh, when someone comes to you, like, so one thing that I think is a character in the creation of burnout is the narrative that somebody is telling 
to themselves about what is happening to them. <laughs> uh, one example of this, if I took you or me and without your permission, I put a, like any of us through like Navy SEALs hell week, it would actually be torture, right? I mean, I would be torturing you, but if you opted into it and if it contextually makes sense to you, it has meaning, then it can actually be something where at the end, it, it still fucking sucks, but at the end you have feelings of victory and accomplishment and connection to your purpose. And, and this could become one of the most important things that you ever got through and you still had to get through it, but it was incredible. And, and you could take pride in it versus this ripped me apart psychologically because I, I felt like it was happening to me. So this, this notion of like, is this happening to me or am I in control of it? Is in my experience, a huge element of whether or not people burn out. And the more out of control they feel, whether they acknowledge it or not, I feel out of control, I'm going to work for it. I feel out of control, I'm going to avoid it more. But if that's present, it is a likely culprit in ultimately having someone wake up one day and say, I just want control back. Even if it means I just need to quit this whole thing, mm -hmm. at least that's me exercising total control mm -hmm. so that I can wake up and I get to decide what I do today. I can't not have this control anymore. It's too painful. I don't know that I'm describing everyone's burnout, but I, I, I do believe that's a, that's, a, that's a lot. So you can help people recontextualize the narrative when they're in that moment of, I feel like I'm being tortured. Now, if they are, you need to resolve that. You don't want to you know, gaslight people. You don't want to put the wool over their eyes and be like, you're not being tortured. This is really, you know, there are absolutely moments of like, hey, you're, you're doing too much. These boundaries need to be enforced. The, the fact that people have needs does not mean that you have capacity to meet those needs. Your capacity is not defined by the need. Your capacity is defined by your capacity, uh, which is a longstanding gripe in HR that's a side point, but I think we've all felt, oh, you guys are fine. You can figure it out. Just sleep less or, you know, all of that. Mm -hmm. um, but when an employee is, uh, I suppose, succumbing to like languishing, despair, uh, that narrative, one thing you can do is not buy into it. You can still be very present. You can still be very supportive. You can truly listen and you can let them have a vent or you can work with them to change something. But if you and, and by the way, many HR leaders are themselves going through this process. So they're going to have to resolve their own thing or else you're just passing that disease along. Yep. I feel out of control. I feel exhausted. I feel like this is all happening to me. And so when someone comes with that narrative to me, I'm like, well, of course. And so I'm not going to break that narrative. I'm going to continue it. And then when someone comes to them as an employee, we're all going to operate within this paradigm of agreeing that what's happening to us is bad that's going to cause systemic problems and individual problems. And so if I am talking to someone who's asking me like as an HR leader, how do I support the people on my HR team? I think the one, you know, the one thing I feel most called to share with this is um, don't indulge that narrative. I mean, objectively, yeah, this is a shit year. Like, you know, weird stuff is going on. Um, and there may be things that have nothing to do with work. You know, I may be stuck at home with a spouse that I'm in the middle of divorcing well, my dog that I had for 15 years that got me through a bunch of tough times is, is you know, passing away. It's like, so it's nothing to do with work and yeah, bad stuff is happening. But within the work paradigm, the more you can not just shape the work up reasonably, but remind them, contextualize them. That, that, that's a form of leadership that is critically important here. We can hold each other, we can carry each other, but let's not succumb to this narrative of, of despair and I'm completely out of control and there's nothing we can do. Um, fight that aggressively. Jonathan, I, I absolutely love it. It's not contrarian, whatever. It just makes absolute sense. And, and, I, and I love the thought process because I think it's not talked about a lot. Like you said, it, it is absolutely not. I mean, you know, there is, you can err on the side of um, inauthentic positivity. And I don't think that's what you're saying at all. But I think right. if you have an unskilled leader, they would default to that. And I think about, it, and it's a really terrible example, but it, I'll 
throw it out there anyway. It's Kevin Bacon at the end of Animal House saying everything is fine, right? Like, and his people are running around, but let's add some levity to a very serious conversation right now. Uh, we're almost done. Last question. I want to leave folks here. Um, there's been some incredible, incredible pieces of information. I hope you were taking notes, folks. One last thing, um, great resignation. Of course, we wouldn't, we have to talk about the great resignation. Anything you could think about, about how to uh, handle or avoid any advice that you have for HR leaders um, that are in the midst of, of this, this great resignation? Um, I would argue I've seen more of the great leave than I did of the, I'm doing of the great resignation. I'm seeing more people take leave, um, but I put it out to you folks. Jonathan, let's start with you and, and Cindy will we'll end this session with your brilliance. Um, any thoughts on HR leadership, advice for HR leadership around this, this great recession, uh, great um, recession, resignation situation? Well, first of all, this may not be perfect, but I'm rooting for the resignators because uh, what, I'm, what I'm seeing, the way I experience it is a lot of people are recognizing that their life isn't fulfilling enough for them. They're taking massive action to change that. And I'm now seeing that move norms in the workplace. I'm pretty pro all that happening. I mean, this is sort of the ultimate vote with your feet kind of moment. Um, at least if you're, you know, an affluent yuppie at knowledge worker. <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> it's not holding true for, for everyone. But um, yeah, I mean, I, look, I, I actually don't know that I have a ton to add here. I, I think that uh, if you're not resolving the things that are going to create the burnout, everyone will eventually leave you. I mean, they're, they're either going to leave you by some sort of resignation, great resignation, I just need to recover, or they're going to leave you just for another job, or they're just, they're just going to check out, they'll still be there, the body's still there, they'll have left you anyway, like they won't really be there anymore. Uh, so is, is there a way to burn someone out and not have them leave? No. <laughs> uh, you know, are, are people dealing with a lot extra right now? Yes. And, and so I guess the one thing I can say is, it's common, in my experience, it's common in the startup industry for your life to shrink to the size of your career and for people to become really focused on them. And often, not always, they are friends with people who indulge that worldview. They date and marry people who are either in the same sort of way of, have used the same lens to look on life and meaning and such, or at least tolerate it or accept it. If, if someone's life can be bigger than their job, and there's other things that give them true nourishment, uh, that can help a lot. So if you really can, this isn't work-life balance. This is someone's life being more than their work. So if you can encourage someone, hey, like you need to put this down. And I don't know what your thing is. I don't know if it's knitting. I don't know if it's video games. I don't know if it's hiking, cooking, napping. That needs to be present in your life in a way that is restorative. So it's not just... We got to fight what's sucking the energy out. There has to be an input. And if it's not going to come from work because we're just in a tough spot, make sure they have it coming in from somewhere else. Like something else has to plug in that can give them that, that reserve tank, like fill up. You know, for me uh, these days, it's, it's just, it's fishing, it's hunting. It's like being out in nature by myself. If you take that away from me, I lose my connection to my own vitality. Uh, for someone else, it might be board games, like who knows? Um, and, and so that would be my one thing. If, if you're a leader working with an HR team that is dealing, it's just sitting in a very difficult moment and their job is to help shepherd a whole company through it, at least in part, make sure that they have something going on that has nothing to do with that job and that they have time to be in that other space or else their whole life just becomes this work thing and this work thing is somewhat difficult right now. So make sure that they have a other life context or several life contexts that are fulfilling. I love it. So Cindy, any advice for the great resignation uh, for HR leaders? Yeah, you know, um, we've experienced and continue to experience a site I'm not as good with analogies, a seismic shift of, in things. We've had <laughs> one earthquake after another. And um, that works. It's, it's shaking things up. Um, but I, 
the the unique thing here, and I say this as somebody who's like still trying to figure out how to battle burnout, is this is our time. This is our time to accept number one that um, people are leaving for other opportunities, and um, you know, if, at this point, if people are already deciding to leave, there's really not much you can do to address that. But you can certainly figure out what's broken or um, not being focused on going forward. But we have champions now to help us in this effort. We don't have to do this alone. And so handling the great resignation, find the champions at the company. We're all going through things now. People managers are taking on a lot of the role of what the people professionals have been expected to do. And they need to, and it's time. Um, The stuff that we're focusing on right now and creating meaningful work, flexibility, connectivity, that's all shit that we've been focusing on as people leaders and people teams. So now we have more people on board with us. Ask for resources. This is the time to get the resources that you need um, to better carry out your jobs as a people team. Um, Call out prioritization and what needs to happen. Seize these opportunities to um, do what we've been like likely going against the grain to try to um, fight for a long time. So I probably have a different twist on this, except that it's happening because it is, um, and figure out how to um, change what you've got going on at your companies by leveraging the help and support of others. I definitely appreciate you both being uh, so open with us about your own experiences, the advice, incredible stuff for all of us to think about within HR. Thank you both, Cindy, Jonathan, thank you for joining me on this session. Hopefully you folks, uh, again, make sure you're chatting in the side chat box here. Hopefully you learned a whole bunch of stuff to think about and take away into your organizations uh, as you head back into likely your next Zoom in the next hour or so. So hopefully you've enjoyed the session. Thank you to my panelists. Appreciate you and we'll see you soon. Thanks. Thank you, Anthony. Thanks, Anthony.